talk is actually a, a double talk. So the first part will be given by uh, Professor Ibro Setti. He's a professor of physiology at Lyon Medical School in the Space Civil de Lyon. And he's also head of the Movement and Handicap Platform for the Multimodal Analysis of Human Movement. Uh, so, uh, the aim of my talk is to briefly review the uh, main feature of the organization of the motor system that may be relevant for uh, the topic of this meeting today, uh, including brain stimulation. And then to take one example, which is the example of prism, prism adaptation, which is something I have been investigating for more than 30 years now. Uh, and uh, I will show what, why I, I, I like this paradigm. It is uh, considered to be a sensory motor paradigm, but uh, the generalization of the uh, aspects that uh, uh, can be triggered by prism adaptation uh, may be very relevant to what we discuss here today. So basically, uh, my group is working on the relationship between perception and action, not only in the traditional form, which is that we all perceive in everyday life that we perceive something and then we have some representations and we're able to uh, develop actions. But also vice versa, what is the effect of action on brain processes and on perception? So considering sensory motor processes as a loop from motor to sensory, from sensory to motor. And uh, in our group, we uh, 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 do uh, basic research in healthy controls or study uh, some neurological models in uh, brain damage patients or uh, neurological patients or uh, doing transient lesions in, uh, in uh, uh, normal subjects, in healthy subjects using brain stimulation. And our aim is to develop diagnosis tools and rehabilitation tools for, for patients. So the, the, I like this, uh, this uh, typical image in France, which is a dialogue between brain and muscles here. Uh, so the general idea is to go from the brain to behavior, that is by uh, brain commands go to muscles, and uh, we can study the impact of central brain lesions on behavior. Uh, for example, so studying as my master, Marc Janrot, who developed, who was a pioneer in analyzing hand movements uh, not only in its most kinematic aspects, basic aspects of motor control, but also in what this can, uh, um, from what we can learn from this in terms of cognition. So he was the one who uh, provided the, the first analysis of human prehension by distinguishing the transport phase and the grasping phase of, of uh, prehension and brought it from the uh, uh, prehistorical age of video recording to a kinematic analysis that we now use in, in the labs and in the hospitals. So when we study such simple action, what we see is only the unfolding of the movement from a starting position to an end position, which is the execution of the action. But the execution of the action is preceded by the brain having to compute hypotheses on the world, computing hypotheses on the body, so that we can ensure that the unfolding of the motor program that we are pre preparing will give the best chance of success. And at the end of the execution of the action, we have to validate or not the hypothesis in order to improve further actions. And for this, we will be uh, having to uh, update these hypotheses about the world or about the body uh, characteristics. So action is has a, a long before that is sometimes longer than action execution and has, is also followed by the evaluation factor uh, that takes place at the end of the action. So just to browse quickly through these uh, processes, we will uh, be begin to uh, look at uh, the three processes in terms of what happens during action preparation, what happens during action execution, and what happens during uh, evaluation. And we will put most emphasis on the evaluation because this is where the brain has to decide whether it has to go through adaptation or learning processes in order to improve further actions. 
So if we start by the intention, that is the philosophical start of action that nobody has ever seen in a, a neuroscience laboratory, of course. Uh, so this is why it is literally fuzzy here. The more we know, the more we are near to the execution of the action, and the less we know, I mean, the, the, the more we go ahead of the action preparation, the less we know. So action is preceded by the ex execution commands, by programming the action, by planification of the uh, action, and by intention and these kind of things. And broadly speaking, some areas in the brain have been attributed to these different processes, going from spinal cord, primary motor cortex, supplementary motor area, premotor cortex, and prefrontal cortex. So basically going vertically first and then frontally towards the anterior part of the brain, uh, looking for intention, if ever we can meet intention in the brain. Uh, so if we look at complex, ac complex actions such as this incredible thing, I don't know if this is real or if this is a montage, uh, but if, imagine this is true, uh, and this is hardly, very hard to believe. This is a, a, an example of how humans are capable of coordinating many different muscles uh, in terms of uh, producing very complex action. I mean, this one is spectacular in the picture, but. Uh, if you think of many sport or music uh, skills, I mean, they are also extremely uh, sophisticated. And so they involve a lot of sequence learning, coordination, uh, use of tools, etc. And so at the level of the organization of action, this gives rise to very complex things. If you take the example of simply uh, making a toast, uh, which is a daily task that may appear very simple and you want to decompose it, uh, and this is a very incomplete schema here, you have to cut the bread, for example, and spread the butter, and you have to decompose if of each of these aims in terms of direct the hand, grasping the object, lift the object, transport the objects, producing a sewing action, etc., etc. And each of these actions have to be decomposed in terms of muscle uh, commands. And of course, we do not intentionally produce uh, action commands at this level, elbow extension, digit section. We can, if we want. I can flex my elbow. But when I make a toast, I never think in terms of I have to flex my elbow. So this shows the, uh, this illustrates the hierarchical model of action whereby we, uh, it, we simply have to think about I am making a toast or I want to make a toast and then the rest unfolds fairly automatically. And it, it unfolds until we have to produce actual actions and produce actual finger grip commands, etc. And one key concept about this is the notion of motor program, which is uh, very well illustrated by this nice uh, figure where you see somebody who was asked to draw with the right hand this sentence, and then with the right arm, which means with the elbow, with the, the pen hold like this, with the left hand, the mouth of the foot, and without to be, aha, I don't know this word in English, graphologist. Does this make sense? Sense. Graphologue, uh, graphologist, I don't know. Uh, you, you, everyone is able to recognize that it is the same person who draw all these traces. And this shows that you have a unique motor representation that is independent of the motor commands that you are delivering to the right hand, to the left hand, to the foot, to the mouth, that can give rise to this production. This demonstrates how well you have this uh, centralized program that uh, 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 is a preliminary process that gives rise to the actual motor commands that are delivered to different muscles or different territories of, of, the, of the body. So this motor program is, is a central memory for action organization. It is also called motor schemes. And you have to uh, uh, set a lot of parameters to produce a, a very simple reaching action, such as localizing the initial effector, localizing the goal, of course, uh, and then analyze the goal in terms of shape, size, orientation, texture, make some predictions about the weight, the fragility, the friction capacities of the objects, the temperature, the speed constraints, depending on the competitive or whatever surrounding you have around, uh, sequences, obstacles, and you have many such parameters that are all automatically uh, processed in the brain prior you simply lift your cup in front of you. And one thing that is very important to highlight is not only our brain is working as an activation of all these things, but there are a lot of inhibitory processes that are also involved in this uh, action. This is important when we think about brain stimulation because when we stimulate the brain, we may stimulate 
uh, excitatory commands or inhibitory commands or both or a mixture of, of those and we have to take these into consideration. So this is an example of a monkey here who has a lesion of the premotor cortex. A normal monkey here with the precentral, not, not a normal, but a control monkey with the lesion of the precentral cortex has been taught to uh, reach for a piece of food that is at the center of the bottom of the cage. And uh, there is a, a holes through, all over the, the, the bottom of the cage and only one hole is open at a time. And the monkey has to reach through the proper hole to get this piece of food. Once the monkey has this uh, premotor lesion, he's unable of inhibiting the direct motor command towards the food that can be seen through the glass here through the perspex actually. So he's in, uh, unable to inhibit this movement and therefore he can never reach for the piece of food. Simply because if you want to produce a more sophisticated action, you first have to inhibit the basic action that you are normally or that you have been trained to do, that you do by habits. So this is about motor preparation. And now a little bit about motor execution. I will be faster here because I, I think this is more familiar for you. So what happens during this reality test for our hypothesis that we put forward on the world and on the body? Uh, during the motor command of the hand, in order to reach for the, 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 the goal of the hand, and during, this, uh, motor, during the unfolding of the action, we have many signals that feed back to the brain. And the brain is capable of using these feedbacks feed forward internal feedbacks, proprioceptive feedbacks, visual feedbacks that are very late with respect to proprioceptive feedbacks in order to feed back the brain and modify the unfolding action. So not only we program the action, but unlike basic computer programs that unfold, we are capable of modif modifying the unfolding of the action online. And this is seen in, for example, this task where you see an object that is moved on the table with uh, magnets that are computer uh, driven underneath the table. And the subject is programming the movement to here, but he's capable of reorienting the hand to reach the final object of the action using proprioceptive feedbacks uh, that uh, allow very fast, like about 100 millisecond time delay for feedback and that are fully independent from consciousness, that we have laboratory tricks whereby we can make the subject unaware of the target jump. And still, we see the hand redirecting towards the goal, and the, object, the subject is not even aware of having modified his, his or her action on flight. So this is completely independent for our consciousness. And following the action, we have to process error signals. Hopefully there is no error signals, and everything is fine, but most of the time, they are large or small or tiny uh, error signals that can be used to, uh, for the brain to decide about whether we uh, will go for uh, adaptation or learning. And this is what I want to talk after this slide. First of all, what I, have seen, what I have shown so far is that the brain is, I mean the motor program is, the motor system, sorry, is organized from the muscle to, between muscles and intention in the form of a series of loops. So you have commands, including intentional comments and feedbacks from the muscles, but also visual feedback, not only uh, proprioceptive feedbacks, but auditory feedbacks, etc., that can be used to modify things. And we have a number of loops with different levels of complexity that reflect uh, uh, monosynaptic uh, um, reflexes, polysynaptic reflexes, simple uh, automatism, uh, innate automatism, complex automatisms, different levels of, of control, of learning, of adaptation. Everything is based on, on the same process, which is everything is a loop with commands delivered to the muscles and feedbacks. And to keep uh, homogeneity within this whole system, to make sure that reflexes produce responses that are compatible with your intention, we have to have the uh, upper levels that are able to modulate the uh, down levels, so that the coherence is maintained into this, hierarchy, this parallelism that we can see in the hierarchy. And this is very important because, of course, the delay for working for simple or complex reflexes is much faster than going up to intention and back. So reflexes would be allowed to, to live, to have their own life uh, before the intention is capable of, of doing what you want to do. 
So it is important that they can be pre-wired or pre-configured so that the coherence is maintained between the lowest level, fast level, and the slowest, higher level. So now I want to focus about what happens after, after the uh, action. It is the evaluation phase. And what I want to argue is that we, uh, these error signals will give rise to adaptation or learning, depending on whether the brain is deciding to update models about the body or update models about the world. The idea here is that adaptation is modifying the organism like adaptation in the phylogenetic uh, uh, meaning, animals may adapt to their surrounding. Whereas learning is when, you have, when you, the brain decides to update models of the world. So you learn something new in a new environment, in new circumstances, using new tools, etc. So it's, it's, it's to face new situations. And you can learn to perform optimally in these conditions if you learn about this situation instead of learning about uh, modifying your body. So my, my uh, uh, a priori distinction between these two f uh, processes is that learning is to acquire new sensory, cognitive, or motor skill that can be used in the future. And I can learn to play the uh, trombone and still be able to do cycling. OK, so usage of a new behavior. Whereas adaptation is to modify an existing function to compensate for sustained environmental changes. For example, you are uh, uh, in the weightlessness and you have to modify all your motor commands to adapt to weightlessness. So you modify the models of your own body instead of models of the environment. So an existing behavior is durably altered to fit a new situation. So you don't acquire a new behavior, but you modify a behavior that was already existing to adapt it to a new situation. And if you don't get it right now what, what exactly it means, I hope we will uh, soon. I think I will skip this one and come back to it maybe for, for questions. So the example I will take here is uh, adaptation to uh, prismatic glasses. Uh, as you can see here, the subjects are asked to wear very strong prisms that will shift the visual field by 10 or 15 degrees, 10 here, 15 here. And the consequence is that when I want to aim for the bottle, my hand will go like this. And this is a huge error signal as compared to what I see in everyday life. And the question that we can ask is, when I face this situation, how do I learn to, pro to use new motor programs? How do I update my motor programs in order to uh, reach appropriately for the object? So the principle of prism adaptation is that usually, in the real space, we see targets, and we have hands, and we are able to direct the hand toward the target easily. But when we have a, a visual space that is shifted with respect to the uh, real world, then we have only access to visual information about the target. And this information is shifted. So of course, the first movement we produce is directed toward the virtual image of the uh, object. And this is known for 130 years to produce uh, uh, brain plasticity. And this is what we still uh, study in, in our laboratory. How do we get from this big error to uh, 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 reproducing normal behavior. So of course, when you end your movement, your hand in the real world is also seen shifted in the prisms. And luckily, the errors that you can see visually in the prisms, although it is between two false representations of the world, the error, the vector, is still uh, true because it is the same as in the real world. So you can use this vector to update the next movement. And you can. Uh, uh, and we can see that the brain is feeding a movement uh, updating that is proportional to the error that has been made in the previous trials. So that in the end, after n, 50, 80 trials, subjects are reaching accurately to the target. But now what happens is that when you remove the prisms and ask subjects, they think they are back to normal. And they want to reach for the bottle. And now they go like this. So it shows that unlike learning, so where I can switch from doing piano to trombone, well, not actually me, but some people can, uh, you, you can still go from one task to another one. Here, the normal behavior has been modified, such as after you remove the perturbation, your behavior is different. Your brain is different. So this is the demonstration of, of brain plasticity, and it is what we call prism adaptation. And one question we can ask, is are you sure that this is adaptation and not learning, or could learning contribute to this, etc.? So I, I, now I want to 
get into how can we properly distinguish what is learning and what is adaptation in terms of these processes. Because in both cases, what you see is that initially you have lots of errors and then they reduce. So apparently you are facing the same kind of problems. You learn or you adapt, which means that you go from big, large errors to uh, small errors. But how can we distinguish the two? The main parameter to distinguish is the presence of after effect. In the end, your brain is not the same as it is in the beginning. If you go back to the first task, you cannot do it anymore. That's the demonstration for adaptation. So is more learning or adaptation uh, compensating for this optical shift produced by the, the prisms? And one way we will ask this question is how transferable is adaptation? So if, if it is true that you modify the model of your body, then if you leave this place and you do something else, then your body is still here and you, can, you should be altered when doing also something else. And this is the question that we'll ask here. After this plastic uh, parameter, after this plastic uh, phenomenon has appeared, does it transfer or not? And does it, mean, it means, will it, be, will it give rise to adaptation or learning? So here is a, a simple task we do usually with prisms, which is to point to targets, visual targets, very uh, basic thing. And another task we uh, have introduced in the laboratory is throwing. So you see the targets there, and people have a, a ball dispenser here, and then they have a switch, and they can get the balls, and then they, move, they, they throw the balls to the, uh, to the panels. And they can throw the balls during uh, uh, lighting conditions with the prisms on so that they get adaptation. And we can also switch off the light, such as they perform the action without getting feedback so that we can measure if there are after effects in the task or not. And uh, well, well, this is again the same thing, closed loop ex exposure or open loop exposure with feedback, with no feedback. And the basic of the task is that we have subjects who perform the prism adaptation with the glasses either with throwing and another group with pointing. And then the question that we'll ask is, in the end, will adaptation done with pointing transfer to throwing and will adaptation done with throwing gen generalize to pointing? And so we have this, this pretest exposure that is throwing or pointing, and then we have the post-test to evaluate if adaptation took place. Uh, please, I, I forgot to tell it, but uh, please interrupt me anytime if you have questions on, on the way, of course. So now, what I want to emphasize with this slide is that everything looks the same in the two groups. From the familiarization phase, you can see the gray or the black dots. During the pretest for the throwing and pretest for the pointing, during the exposure with the large errors in the beginning and the error reduction curve here, everything looks very similar for the two groups of subjects. And when you look at after effects, you get exactly super impossible. Each point is a trial. You get that subjects perform exactly in the same way whether they were exposed to throwing or to pointing. So everything looks the same. But now the question is, how do we get transfer from pointing to throwing or from throwing to pointing? And the answer is very different. The group who has been trained with throwing has got no zero transfer to uh, pointing, whereas the group who was exposed to pointing gets substantial uh, transfer to the throwing task. And then the question arises, how can we distinguish between these two things? This would seem that every, despite sim extreme similarity between everything from beginning to the end, is it possible that one group has been learning and one group has been adapting? This is what these results seem to indicate. And at the level of the group, it is very statistically highly significant that we have a purely unidirectional, that is the average of the uh, uh, throwing group is zero, whereas the other one is 40% of transfer. So transfer depends on the task that you use during exposure, which may suggest that some people may do learning, some people may be uh, uh, adapting. And one question we ask is, is it transfer, is it expertise? that explain this. We all perform thousands of pointing movements every day, but throwing is something that is much less practiced. We all practice uh, throwing, but when I said everything was highly similar here, it was very true for averages, but in terms of variability, of course, throwing was much more variable within subjects, between subjects, than pointing. 
So this is a measure of expertise for us. So to know whether expertise predicts whether the brain is capable of choosing between learning of adaptation, we just picked up the French team of dart throwing and got them into the lab. And uh, so when we perform the exact same task, we see that for the pointing task, they are a little bit less variable than uh, in the uh, stu other, other students. And when we study the throwing task, of course, they are much less variable than the uh, other people. And actually, the, it was very impressive, the level of accuracy of these people. I have never watched the dart throwing for, for real, but it was really impressive because they destroyed the central, uh, central one centimeter square of the panel <laughs> uh, just uh, uh, even after 40 normal subjects. So the variability is, is less, which is just a confirmation for their expertise. And then if we look at their capability for transfer, after, transfer of after effects, this is the transfer in the throwing group, in the pointing group, the after effects, showing that only the pointing group transfers to uh, uh, throwing, whereas the throwing group does not transfer to pointing. And now for experts, you see that they are producing the same after effects, same learning, but they show also transfer from throwing to pointing. So it shows that if you want to produce generalizable uh, effects, it is better if the task is mastered before you produce plasticity, before you, you try to learn or adapt. Because if you adapt, this means that you will produce generalizable effects, whereas if you learn, learning is local and will remain local to a given situation. So the expert dot throwing show transfer to pointing. So, uh, I mean, one open question here today, of course, is would this happen to cyclists? I, we, haven't we haven't begun to investigate this, but we have uh, to, in order to investigate the, generalization, the general rule here, we are now testing uh, table tennis experts to see if they adapt during table tennis, will they be able to transfer or not with compared to, to, to normals and comparing people with different uh, level of uh, expertise. You plan to give the premium classes to cyclists? Not yet. I'm just, cycling is just here for today, <laughs> because this is the main theme today, but why not? <laughs> uh, so another interesting question about adaptation is how far can adaptation expand to other domains? And uh, luckily with uh, my friend Gilles Rod, who is the dean of the medical school and the head of the rehabilitation unit, we have been studying very singular patients uh, that show uh, a syndrome that is called unilateral spatial neglect. These patients, after a brain lesion on the right side, usually forget the left half of space. Uh, you can see a, an apple pie made by the patient with uh, uh, neglect. And clearly, uh, you can see the apples missing on the left. You can see a, a drawing of a, of a man done by a patient. I mean, if you ask the patient how many uh, arms, eyes, uh, legs do we have, they all say two. They know this well. But if they are asked to draw this, they will forget one eye, one arm, one leg. This is uh, coloring, just a, a children uh, kindergarten task that we ask on this, these patients. And I like to show this one. This is the only timing, I mean, as compared to the timing you showed on cyclists, this is the only timing reference I have here. Here is a patient who is the head he was the head of the financial uh, um, department of, of a very big uh, uh, industry in France. He spent nine minutes, 30 seconds, coloring this, uh, um, I forgot the word, this bug. <laughs> Ladybird, Lady yes. And you can see that he spent so much time on the right that there is no more paper here. The white here is not forgotten, it's just because the paper went off. But still, never went to the left side of the, of the bug. So this is a very strange disease, very hard to understand. After 30 years of working on, on this, I feel I understand it less and less. But luckily, even though we don't understand what's going on there, we are happy to show that spending a few minutes with glasses on can improve these patients. This is what I want to show now. So using prisms, you can uh, modify uh, uh, visual motor coordination in normal subjects, and you, this applies also to patients. So these patients, despite of their brain lesion, can adapt completely to prisms, and they tend to show more after effects than normals. This is interesting, after a brain lesion, to do something better than normals. But now the question is, 
after doing this task of producing errors to the right and thus producing adaptation that will compensate towards the left, will this apply to other domains than simply visual motor coordination? And here is what we obtain in a drawing task, which is to copy this model here. This is what the, the patient copied prior to prism adaptation, after adaptation here, and two hours later. And you can see that the patient is recovering the left half of space after having worn five minutes these prisms, even though the patient had got his lesion two years before. Two years left alone, the brain could not compensate, and after five minutes of this exercise, the brain was able to compensate, whether, whereas a control patient wearing sham prisms would not improve at all during the same task. And you can see at the group level that control patients who have the, the sham prisms do not improve, whereas patients with prisms improve very quick and uh, impressively after uh, five minutes of this uh, practice. And this is true not only for these drawing tasks that are still visual motor, but this may go to very abstract tasks. For example, Gilles Rod tried to uh, uh, this mental imagery task by which he asks patients to represent mentally the map of friends. And uh, then he asks them to locate all this, the, to name all the cities they can see on, them, on their mental map. And you can see that a typical neglect patient starts from Lille, goes to Strasbourg, Paris, Lyon, etc., and omit completely the left half of the map, the western half of the map, I should say. And after five minutes of prisms, you can see that his mental representation of the world has been changed. Now he tends to omit a little bit of the eastern border of France, but goes to Brest, Nantes, uh, Bordeaux, etc. So this shows how generalizable can be adaptation as compared to the local uh, feature that characterizes uh, learning. Now, can brain stimulation boost adaptation? I know that uh, Vance is very keen on uh, collaborating about brain uh, stimulation, so I took a, uh, two examples here. So we all know that you can simulate the nervous system at the very different levels. You can stimulate uh, uh, at the central level, the brain level. You can stimulate the cerebellum. You can stimulate the spinal cord. You can stimulate the muscles. You can stimulate the peripheral nerves. Uh, and this may produce very different, aspect, uh, uh, different results. I want to emphasize the role of uh, uh, stimulating the primary motor cortex. Because the primary motor cortex appears to be located at the low level of the motor cognition hierarchy, just kind of the output of the brain. But in fact, when you stimulate the primary motor cortex, you happen to stimulate all the networks that are involved in the preparation, in the execution, in the evaluation of action. That is, stimulating the primary motor cortex will also in turn stimulate cerebellum, basal ganglia, premotor cortex, etc. And we know that if you stimulate with, for example, physiological stimulation such as TDCS, the stimulation will be very much dependent on the tasks that you do during the stimulation. So it means that the stimulation is not a, a kind of, uh, I don't know how to say, but gross stimulation that stimulates one area. But if you stimulate physiologically, you cannot stimulate the area. You stimulate a function. And it stimulates the function that you are activating during the stimulation. That can be very specific. So I want to show one example here, which is stimulating the primary motor cortex while you do prism adaptation. And when you do this, if you see the after effects of people who are controlled in here in blue, you see that people who are in red here can have much longer lasting effects. So it shows that in the beginning, they may have only slightly increased after effects, but the most salient feature is that after several days, people who have been stimulated during the PRISM exercise still show after effects, whereas people who have been stimulated by the uh, sham stimulation uh, have after effects vanishing within minutes. So stimulating motor cortex will en en enhance the retention of the uh, adaptation phase. And this is very strange because we know that PRISM adaptation relies, uh, rela is under uh, that the cerebellum is the neural substrate for prism adaptation. And we have tried to stimulate the cerebellum in many different ways, and we never produce such good results as we have when stimulating the primary motor cortex. So that's very interesting to see that this functionally specificity of uh, stimulation 
may occur when you stimulate the primary motor cortex, even better than when you target uh, other targets. Um, so now, if we use this brain stimulation of the motor cortex during prism adaptation, can we further improve the therapeutical benefit that we have in uh, spatial neglect patients, for example? First of all, uh, uh, here is the montage for the uh, brain stimulation in, in these patients. So we combine prism adaptation and TDCS, brain stimulation, with anodal stimulation on the primary motor cortex. And what we see is that, as I have shown before, we have stronger after effects and longer lasting after effects after anodal stimulation as compared to sham stimulation. This is the motor after effect. But now if you look at neglect scores, so how much the patient will omit the left half of space, you see that after anodal stimulation, patient has a numerous pretest and then introducing prism adaptation with brain stimulation. And you see this strong improvement in the neglect scores. Whereas if you do this with the sham stimulation, this patient shows no further improvement. So stimulating the primary motor cortex during prism adaptation further boosts the therapeutic effects of prism adaptation. And this is one practical example where you can see a patient before adaptation, is the, the patient was asked to do a gardening task, which is to put flowers, daffodils, I think, uh, on, the, on the piece of, of artificial grass. And you can see uh, the, uh, the omission of the patient. And this is after uh, basic prisms, where you can see the improvement. And then the patient after prism and TDCS, where you can see the initial omission. And in the end, the, the patient is capable of uh, uh, using all the space, including the extreme left, extreme left space that is available in the piece of grass. So why adaptation? Because adaptation, as I already mentioned, is by difference to learning that is context specific and local, adaptation has generalization properties, transfer properties to other tasks, other limbs. And also can transfer beyond sensory, oops, sorry, and also, uh, I don't know why this one went there, but expand be beyond sensory motor variables, which means that we can use sensory motor adaptation, this kind of stupid task to perform a reaching movement with glasses on, to modify spatial cognition in these patients, to improve visual constructive deficits shown in uh, other patients, as shown by Gilles Rod to improve chronic pain in patients with uh, uh, algodystrophia. And we can also alter the uh, spatial cognition of healthy subjects using this task. So it is funny that we first discovered the, the defect in the patient, and then we are now showing that also in the normal subjects, you can also uh, modify things. And to conclude, the, the only thing I would like to say is that in the uh, pan-representative era, or pan-cognitive uh, era that we are in, we tend to, to give much more focus on top-down processes. We, think, we, term, we tend to think that everything comes from the brain, the mind, the intention, and then we uh, produce commands, etc. So cognitive representations seem to be hierarchically higher than sensory motor processes because they can configure sensory motor processes, they can elicit motor commands, they can inhibit motor commands, etc. But why, what I have shown here during this talk is that not only we go from the brain to the, to the action, but activating sensory motor processes that can be fairly low, such as pointing to visual targets, can in turn structurate, modify, uh, and, and, and produce very uh, strong actions on cognitive representations, such as uh, modifying the representative of representation of space, mental representations, representation of, of numbers, uh, uh, processing of, of sounds on the left, etc. And I mean, this may uh, seem to be uh, unexpected, but altogether, it is simply a replication of what Piaget already argued for a long time ago, saying that the development of children intelligence was based on the development of their sensory motor interactions except that this was see, visible at the, at the scale of several years, whereas here we can see this at the, at the level of, different, of several minutes in, uh, in adults. Voila, this is what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention.
about this uh, uh, prison technique, uh, but how much does it last? Alors, uh, the, if you study this in students, usually you wear prisms for 5, 10, 20 minutes, and after half an hour, people are back to normal. Strangely, and we still don't really understand why, if you do this in patients, because the prisms are very heavy, we use it only for five minutes, and they may show effects for one week. Sensory motor effects. And then, there is also a very strong dissociation between the sensory motor effects produced in the patients and the therapeutic effects. That is, if you study the after effects in asking them to point, and they still miss the target, this can disappear, get back to normal, when the patient is still improved in terms of paying attention to things on the left, and not, not anymore forgetting to shave on the left, or etc., etc. So we don't understand why uh, the effect is stronger in patients. Uh, the only hypothesis we have to explain this is that uh, patients are not aware of the prismatic shift. That is, when you do this task in normals, they do this and say, oh my god, first reaction is really emotional. You do this with patient, and they do this again and again until they reach the, the, the thing. And you ask them, we have used very detailed phenomenolo phenomenological questionnaires in order to assess their awareness at an implicit level, etc., for the shift. They are aware of zero about the shift. So this is an argument to say that this is also why we think that these patients are using much less learning which requires a strategical thinking, and rely more on adaptation, which is probably why they show more after effects and more generalization of the effects afterwards. Uh, and then uh, the, the duration of the, of the therapeutical effects in the patients is, uh, as frequently with patients, highly variable. We have seen patients who were virtually cured after one session of five minutes, and we have seen patients who are back to norm, back to not to normal, but back to the previous state after 24 hours, for whom we have to do daily daily training uh, sequences for one week, for example, uh, to improve them durably, and then the improvement can last for several months. Are there are some patients that are uh, resistant to this therapy. Yes, the patient I have shown here uh, before in the uh, TDCS experiment. Uh, was a patient who was included in the clinical trial with PRISMs two years before and had got uh, PRISMs several times when uh, he became resistant to PRISMs. And then we tried to use PRISMs with TDCS and then we showed again a, a very strong effect that appeared with, when, when it was combined with TDCS. So he became resistant to PRISM alone. You can see the uh, PRISM alone does not improve neglect score, but when you do PRISM and TDCS, bang, you see the improvement. And we've seen several such patients like this. It seems that TDCS is, is able to turn non-responders into responders. Uh, um, a comment and a question. Comment is um, your table tennis work. Um, I would like to, to let you know that uh, Jean-Christophe Gimini, who's uh, in the physics lab, is working on table tennis right. uh, stuff. Um, it's a physics problem, but it would be very interesting, I think, if the two projects were combined. So yeah. I'll put you in contact with him. Great. Because uh, he just started that project and got funded for yeah, it. So and we uh, should have started if there was no COVID. <laughs> yeah. Everything um, is so ready. Uh, <laughs> that's one, one good news. Um, Am I correct? Could it be that in this situation here, that it seems like people who are neglecting, they have a bandwidth that's like here, and you shift that bandwidth over to here. And it seems like I lost on one of the, the slides, particularly the map, that they seem to forget over here. So their bandwidth didn't seem to expand, but it seemed to be shifted. Whereas now with the DDS, it's like this, and then, then it does this, and there's actual bandwidth that expands. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, we, uh, we have measured actually on the map of France, I mean, the, the band and the, and, the, and the shift. And we are able to show that some patients show only a shift and some patients show a shift plus an increase of the bandwidth. And is that dependent on the TDDS? 
with, even with prisms even alone. That, oh, we have okay. patients who show only the shift and patients who show both. Okay. And with TDCS, we have both every time. Okay, so it's not just the TDS that yeah. does that. Uh, it, could be, it could be symmetry also, right? Because it seems, for example, with uh, Ladybird, that uh, they use the symmetry to imagine that what they have done on the right-hand side is okay for the left-hand side. And with the glasses, you break the symmetry. And so they don't have access to use this. Perhaps they are, in a sense, more clever than we do. They are, they are imagine, uh, thinking that the, there is a symmetry, and uh, they use uh, this yes, so. This is very interesting about neglect. It is the fact that whenever you use symmetrical objects, you get more neglect. For example, if you use glasses that are symmetric, they keep the symmetry. Uh, glasses that are symmetric, what do you mean? Uh, one eye in one way and the other way. Yeah, exactly. And then you kill the patient. <laughs> you get strong headache if you do like but this. But you already started to kill the patient. <laughs> no, uh, but uh, for example, in the task I've shown, uh, yes, this one, for example, is not symmetrical. So we often also use tasks that are symmetrical because this improve, increases neglect, mm -hmm. but you may have tasks where there is no symmetry at all and they simply have to look for objects everywhere and you improve them in both types of tasks. But it is true that symmetry plays a role in the measuring the magnitude of neglect. 